Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Floyd Norman. Welcome. Hello there. I'm Floyd Norman. <laughs> Who am I? I am a, an animator, animation storyteller, story artist. I, I've done every job imaginable in animation. Lo loved every minute of it. And uh, I'm still doing it even today at the ripe old age of 87. So happy to be here. Happy to have you. So um, you were born and raised in Santa Barbara, California. Um, mm -hmm. How was it growing up? Fantastic. I I'm one of the few people who can actually say my childhood was almost perfect. It was idyllic. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the right place at the right time. And lucky me that I was born back in 1935 in Santa Barbara, California, a general hospital. And um, man, oh man, all I can say is oh, what a lucky kid I was to grow up in what was just an ideal community. My grandmother was an incredible person. Uh, not that my mother wasn't because my mother was extremely supportive. Although my mother did not always understand uh, my dreams and my uh, goals and my ambitions. Well, she supported me. She was never negative. But when it comes to real support, my grandmother w was exceptional. Uh, my grandmother, like my parents and, and well, our whole family, they were all from the South. And I really don't know where my grandmother received her education. But boy, she was a very savvy woman. Her name was uh, Emma Fitzgerald Davis. Uh, she was, um, she married my grandfather. My grandfather lost his wife when she was quite young. And so my grandfather married again, and he married this Southern woman, uh, rather fair skin Southern woman. She was black, but she was very fair. Mm -hmm. And that was Emma Fitzgerald Davis. And she was an, an incredibly ambitious uh, young woman. And uh, I don't know where she got her knowledge. I, I don't even know her educational background. But boy, she was savvy when it came to business. And she was totally supportive of me when she found out that I loved Walt Disney and animated cartoons. And I told my grandmother, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And she said, well, let's do it. And mm -hmm. so she was incredibly supportive. She seemed to understand something that nobody else, no other adult understood. She understood the animation process. How she knew that, I do not know. But she helped me build an animation camera stand. She helped me acquire my first 16 millimeter uh, motion picture camera. She helped me make animated films. And she kind of like, kind of like made that pathway from Santa Barbara to Burbank to the Walt Disney studio. Mm -hmm. She knew that one day I was going to work for Walt Disney and she was going to make every effort to see that her grandson realized his dream. So I owe a great deal to, to my grandmother because she was my biggest supporter and uh, just a real inspiration. Did you have any like favorite, like traditions or, or kind of, like things that you did growing up with your family? Traditions, I, I don't think any different from the average family, you know, uh, you know, family outings, picnics. I remember one of the highlights of, of when I was a kid, uh, our, our church always had a church picnic. Mm -hmm. And that was always kind of like a big deal because that was an annual picnic and we had it once a year. And, you know, you'd go out and you'd grill and all this food and then the kids would run and play and we would go down to the stream or we would climb the mountains. It was just a fun day and it was a real wholesome family type, uh, you know, uh, church picnic. Yeah. And uh, it was stuff like that. I mean, it, it really, our lives were not unusual in any way. They were quite normal. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just look back on my childhood as just being just a lot of joy, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, no, no trauma, no stress. Mm hmm uh, we we were blessed with uh, sufficient uh, in terms of enough to eat and a place to live. Mm -hmm. we, we weren't poor by any means. We certainly weren't wealthy, mm -hmm. but, but neither were we poor. Mm -hmm. and, and we never, I don't recall ever going without. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. I don't recall ever being hungry. I don't recall any negatives that, and I hear this from a lot of people whose lives were not easy. Right. And they had a fair amount of hardships in their life. I, I'm, I'm happy to say I had none. <laughs> so, um, like, uh, you co-founded Vignette Films with my birthday twin, Leo Sutherland. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, it was Leo's idea to, to make, I mean, I, I, to me, it was just a hobby. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just invented this name, Vignette, because of, I thought it would be a cool name for, for an animation company. You yeah. know, like, hey, we run this company called Vignette. I just, right. you know, I just chose the name because it sounded cool. Right. Well, lo and behold, Leo and, and our partners went out and, and made the, the company legit. And that is, it, it literally became a California corporation. Mm-hmm. We were Vignette Films Incorporated. Because when you're doing educational films, you know, there, there, there's no glamour in doing that. Mm-hmm. And there's certainly no money. Mm-hmm. However, we did that for a number of years. And I'm very proud, very proud of the work we did at Vignette because I think our work was good. And and what we did with our limited resources, I look back on it as really quite incredible. And, and when I look back on my career, uh, some of the most satisfying times was when I ran my own company. Mm-hmm. along with my partner, Leo Sullivan, Dick Allen, and Norm Edlin, mm-hmm. four young African-American men who had the audacity mm-hmm. to open a film company in Hollywood. And and this was in the 1960s. You know, I mean, what a, what a time to try to, to launch a film company in America in the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the, in the midst of the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. What we did took a lot of guts, and we were audacious to even dream of doing such a thing, and yet we did it, and we're going to do that, even though there are so many things against us, so many obstacles, so many doors slammed in our faces over the years because we were filmmakers of color mm-hmm. at a time when that was an extremely rare thing in Hollywood, you know, people of color making films. Producing, directing, writing. Uh, for that time period, we were indeed uh, bold and daring and a little bit crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you all get the opportunity to do the Soul Train logo? That came about almost, again, like a lot of jobs, these things happen by chance. We had worked on a TV show for ABC called Turn On. And the director of that TV show was a young man named Mark Warren. Once again, a black director at a time when there were very, very few African-American directors working in Hollywood. Well, we had worked with Mark on Turn On, this ABC ABC sketch comedy show. And now Mark Warren had been given uh, this TV pilot to direct. And it was about kids uh, dancing. And, and it was called Soul Train. Uh, I didn't really know it because it, the show was a big hit back in Chicago. So I wasn't in Chicago, so I didn't even know much about it. Mm-hmm. We got a call from Mark Warren saying, hey, I'm, I'm directing this TV pilot called Soul Train. And I need a logo to put, you know, at the start of the show that introduces the show. And I want to use animation. Can you guys animate a train? You know, and so the train goes down the tracks and then the logo solo train, you know, comes out of the uh, out of the smokestacks, I guess. And so, yeah, so that's how we ended up doing the soul train animated introduction. And uh, and again, you know, the rest is history. But there's still uh, a lot of people who who really don't know that much about this very important part of, of, of black history. And so once again, I mean, uh, we were guys who were making films on black history. And so this was right up our alley. This was what we did best. And uh, we did many, many projects where we were. And and again, not only were we teaching others, but for ourselves, it became an educational experience for me because I learned so much by making these films. I learned so much about my own history just by being involved in the writing and production of these films on black history. 
Um, can you talk about the movie Bushhead, uh, who you were working with and what you felt the film could have provided to the animation industry at the time? Wow. <laughs> there's there's an interesting segue. <laughs> Bushhead was a project that sadly was never completed. Mm -hmm. It, it uh, caught me by surprise. I remember at the time, it was the 1970s, and I was animating at Hanna-Barbera. I remember that that time in particular. Um, Smokey Robinson, who was uh, part of uh, Motown, mm -hmm. uh, partnered with Barry Gordy, who was the, you know, the founder of Motown. Um, Motown had moved to Hollywood and they had a series of offices on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And I was invited down to Motown to meet with Smokey Robinson and his team. And it concerned a animated motion picture that Smokey wanted to do. Smokey was going to write all of the music for a new animated film called Bushhead. And it was going to be about a prehistoric caveman except that this caveman was a caveman of color. Mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he wasn't Fred Flintstone. <laughs> he, was going to be, he was going to be a black caveman. Mm -hmm. And because he had this, this big fro, uh, his nickname was Bushhead. <laughs> and that was the title of our movie. Mm -hmm. And so we had heard that Smokey wanted to do this film. And we spent about six months in development developing character designs, environments, art direction, model sheets, storyboards, and we presented all of this material in a big meeting with Barry Gordy, mm -hmm. who, like I said, was the head of Motown. And uh, Barry Gordy had this deal that he was going to interest Universal Pictures into coming up with the money to produce this animated feature film called Bushhead. Well, it turns out at the time, Universal Pictures was involved with another project of Barry Gordy's called The Wiz. Mm -hmm. And Universal said, you know, we don't have the money to do both. Mm. You can either do The Wiz or you can do Bushhead, but you can't do both. So I think we all know which project got the green light. Yeah. And, of course, we never heard from Bushhead ever again. Yeah. But that's that's what happened. Uh, what would you say your favorite aspects of African-American culture and the, and the positivity we exhibit as a community? I think immediately the first thing that comes to mind is music. Music. Mm -hmm. I think our music is not... From 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 church spirituals to to the clubs, the the jazz clubs, you know, uh, I hear black music, and it it it's, you know, I mean, even going to a, a church service and hearing the performance of the choir and some of the singers, you know, there's nothing quite like that. Mm -hmm. I had a, a visitor who came all the way from Europe. Mm -hmm. He came all the way from Italy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he wanted to do in America was to go to a black church because he wanted to experience that kind of special magic that happens in a black church when when the choir performs. There's nothing like it. I remember it when I was a child going to church, my my, my home church in Santa Barbara, where my, my, my mother and my grandmother attended and and uh, of course, my mother sang in the church choir. Mm -hmm. My mother sang loudly. I mean, I, I never forget. <laughs> she, I could hear her voice over all the others. You know, I don't know <laughs> if my mother was great, but but if if she wasn't great, she was sure loud. <laughs> but, but but anyway, no, there's that 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 special quality. Um, you mentioned uh, your children. You have uh, twin daughters, and yes, I do. I have a twin brother. How about that? Yeah. Well, twins are good. I mean, why not? You know, <laughs> two's better than one. <laughs> it's like, you know, buy one, get one free. You know, that's what the hospital said. When I went to the hospital, I had my twins. They said, buy one, get one free. 
can you talk a little bit about being a father and like, what do you like about being a dad? I've always wanted to be one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always amazed when people say that uh, they don't want to have children mm -hmm. or they don't want the responsibility of children. Um, I could see why people would maybe not want to go through that. Uh, it ain't easy being a parent. That's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I knew that going in and I know that with all of the challenges and sometimes difficulty of being a parent, uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I don't regret being a father. Mm -hmm. I don't regret being a parent. I think if you're not a parent, there's going to be so much you're not going to learn about life. It, mm -hmm. it, it literally, being a parent, it's going to change who you are. It, it impacts your life in such a profound way that you are never the same person. And yet I can sympathize with those who don't want this responsibility of being a, a parent to a bunch of kids because there will be challenges because it's not easy. It's not easy dealing with little ones. It's not easy dealing with big ones. <laughs> but it's going to be a challenge all the way through. Mm -hmm. But out of all that, I find it's been, for me anyway, incredibly rewarding. Uh, I love my kids. I like my kids. They've given me tough times, all of them, my sons, my daughters. They haven't always been easy. Some have been tougher than, than others. Mm -hmm. Some have been, you know, very mild and mellow and not a problem. Others have been just raising the dickens. <laughs> but, you know, they're all different. They're different personalities. So mm -hmm. each one has their own particular uh, challenge. So, but quite frankly, I have no regret being a parent. I have no regret being a father. It is probably one of the more important things I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. And when I look at my life and my career, I have to say being a parent is probably the probably the most significant thing I've done uh, with my life. It's important. It really it's important. And uh, I have I have no regrets. I I, uh, I think um, being a parent has not only been you know, it's been really good for me. I think I, I have, you know, of all of us, I think I'm the one who's probably benefited the most. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm the recipient of the, of the, of the blessings. So yeah. yeah, I've got, I've got no complaints. So I want to thank you for allowing me to highlight you as a few, full human being on the platform. <laughs> a full fledged human being. Yeah. Here, here I am. Not just Floyd Norman, like person who worked at Disney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm Floyd Norman, the person who worked at Disney, Hanna Barbera, <laughs> Ruby Spears, mm -hmm. Kurtz and Friends. Where else? I've worked <laughs> everywhere. I worked all over town, <laughs> all over town, but uh, enjoyed every minute of it. And if you are lucky enough to be in this crazy business, and it is crazy, no doubt about it, it is a crazy business. But I tell you, I, I love it. And at age 87, and I mean, I'm 87 years old, and it's not old yet. I'm old, but animation is not old. Animation still has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky enough to be on this train, keep riding the train because you never know where it's going. So train. So train. There you go. That's right. That's okay. right. Keep on riding that soul train. <laughs> <laughs> and to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to the Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Boom.